Good evening, everybody. You're listening to A Sky Full of Stars here on AFM Radio. Tavi Greiner and myself, Rob Cowan, have two special guests with us tonight. Jen and Andy Shear, who are both involved in the Space Shuttle program and in the upcoming launch. And we're going to be doing a couple of things, chatting with them for a little bit, and then going through a walk-down tour of Pad 39A at the Kennedy Space Center. Uh, which is where Atlantis is poised for its next launch. So I'm going to start out by saying hi to uh, to both Jen and Andy, and welcome to the show. Hi, thanks. Hey, thanks for having us. You know, I'd like to start out. It's sort of unique that we, I should first of all tell everybody that they are married, as opposed to like brother and sister. And uh, it's kind of unique to have a, uh, a married couple be associated with, uh, well, at least for this listening audience, such a uh, amazing device and I thought maybe Jen you could start and give a little uh, background about yourself and then Andy if you want to pick it up and tell us what uh, what your basic job responsibilities there are at uh, KSC okay um, I'm a shuttle technician I work at the hypergolic maintenance facility which uh, we work on the actual shuttle vehicle um, on the ohms pods and the forward reaction control system module. Um, I've been the, I've been out at the space center for going on eight years, um, and the last five and a half or so have been at the um, HMF, is what we we call it for short. Great. And how about you, Andy? Okay, I started out there in. 2000. Uh, we moved here together from Wichita, Kansas. We both worked at the uh, Cessna aircraft plant out in Kansas. That's where we met. And we moved here in July of 2000. And the first place I started working was at the pads. I've been there the whole time, all nine years now, um, in the same shop in the, uh, what is, it's called a PRSD cryogenic shop, which stands for a uh, Power reactant storage and distribution. It's a, it's a mouthful, but it's basically uh, the fuel cells on board the vehicle, what produces the power, um, mm -hmm. all that associated ground support equipment at the pad um, is what we're responsible for. And for the last four years, I've been the, the that shop lead on uh, pad A. Great. And it's interesting. So you met at the Cessna plant. Yes, uh, working on uh, Citation jets. Interesting. Are, are, are either or both of you pilots? I started out, but I didn't quite finish gotcha. um, pilot training. Okay. Now, you know, it's interesting. We're sitting here talking to you, and I'm, I'm going to turn this over to Tavi for a while, but the reason that the four of us are sitting here talking really has a lot to do with Twitter and social media. I mean, that's really one of the unique aspects is that uh, we have all kind of gotten to know one another, uh, not not in some sort of you know intimate, uh, deep friendship, although those do exist certainly because of uh, social media. But we all have kindred interests of uh, space and astronomy outreach, and that's kind of what brought us here. And uh, Tavi, why don't you go ahead and uh, and talk uh, talk a little bit uh, about Space Tweeps? The Space Tweeps Society is uh, well. First of all, it's growing. Uh, Astronomically. <laughs> By the way, what it, is a tweep? A tweep is a um, a space tweep. Is a a um, a tweep is just a person on Twitter. Yeah, and so a space tweep would be uh, you know some a space enthusiast, um, an astronomy enthusiast. And I, uh, Jen really Jen should talk about the Space Tweep Society. She founded the Space Tweep Society. And um, it started out with just a few people, but it quickly grew. Uh, and it's, it, it is a, a fantastic site, to, site that gives everyone a voice. Um, you don't have to be a professional blogger uh, or anything like that. And it's, it's been fantastic to see people um, sharing their views on uh, all the aspects of space, the space program and space flight and things like that. Yes, it's, it's been a lot of fun. Um, it was just this idea I had one day after seeing um, some some of the people that I followed on Twitter that were space enthusiasts uh, sort of rally around one of our our own um, after she'd had some uh, trouble at, with work about 
tweeting. It wasn't really well thought of. And I, I saw how much support there was for her. And that just made me start thinking about the potential for a strong community and what that could accomplish. So that's when I, the first thing I did was, was to design the logo, which is maybe backwards, but, but that's what I did. And then it grew from there. Now, that's curious because, so this was before NASA had embraced social media the way that it has now? It was uh, around this time that that was starting. Okay, okay. Well, that's interesting. I had no idea that's how it started. And now it has grown into really an international community. If you go to a spacetweepsociety.org, uh, as Tavi said, it's a, it's a really interesting open organization. What, what is your, I mean, do you have any goals or is it just a collaboration of people talking about how social media can, uh, can further space outreach? Is that really what it's about? Well, the, um, the actual mission statement for it is um, to promote enthusiasm for all things space and to unite those inside the space industry with those who are outside looking in. Yeah, and, and it certainly has done that. That's that was my goal because I saw that the people that were outside of of the industry were like looking and wistfully in, you know, like oh, I wish I could be a part of that and I wanted to find a way to include them and let them be part of it. And I want to mention that um it, this is very special because as we're talking about this right now and how um the community, the international space enthusiast community has embraced this space tweet uh, society. We have Eric. Um, he's attended several of these NASA tweet ups. He's there um, in Florida right now. He got there today. But he learned how to sew. He brought his sewing machine with him. And he has um, made, created, um, made a Miko doll. Did you see that yet, Jen? I just saw that a little while ago. I can't believe that he went to so much trouble. <laughs> Isn't it's it? Amazing. And and it carried this um, sewing machine with him to the launch. I know that's that's amazing, isn't it? Yeah, and it seems like a little thing, but I just I think it's a, a wonderful example of um, how people are embracing the Space Tweet Society. They really are. I'm I'm amazed still to see how well it's done. Yeah. Well, you know, and it brings up an interesting point, and then we'll uh, we can move on to the slideshow since we got uh, got a lot of ground to cover. You know, we mentioned the tweet up, and for those that are not Twitter savvy, uh, a tweet up is a physical meeting of uh, of um, uh, Twitter users of tweets, and uh, uh, it's it's held in all different areas. It can be held around a specific technology, a specific product, a specific geographical area, like uh, things of that sort, political uh, uh, areas. And uh, NASA started these tweet ups, and, and uh, Tavi and I had the uh, the pleasure of going to the very first one, uh, and uh, then they had a second one, which I think, uh, Jen, I had to run out. I think you were at the second one, were you not, um, uh, with the um, ISS? I w was that the second or the third? Third. That I'm was sorry. the third. Yeah. yeah. Third one. Yeah, I was at the ISS one. Yeah, and uh, I unfortunately had to run out and miss the uh, tour of NASA TV. Uh, which I was really disappointed, but I had a train to catch. Um, and they're really unique. I mean, uh, sitting in the um, Webb Auditorium there at NASA headquarters in, in Washington, D.C., I looked around myself and I said, you know, normally this place would be filled with professional media reporters, and, and probably there were a few there that were professional media, but the 99% of the attendees are regular, I don't want to call them users, but space and science enthusiasts and that's a really interesting outreach opportunity for NASA and then beyond NASA for all of the other things including uh, right here on uh, uh, sky full of stars and astronomy.fm so it's pretty uh, it's pretty unique well Jen Andy I'm gonna turn it over to you uh, you can you can start with the next slide which is the beginning of your slide deck and uh, and walk us through the uh, Walk us through pad 39A. Okay, we'll give it a shot. I wanted to mention you have a little pointer there that you can use. Okay. Okay, this is standing on the 
255 foot level of the uh, fixed servo structure and out there looking out toward the the crawler way where the the shuttle actually rolls up uh, when it rolls out um the building in the, in the distance out there is actually where i work um on a daily basis out there that's right there so in the upper left corner there is what they call the is the gox vent arm um, or the beanie cap what you see over the top of the external tank um, oh yeah well, that's the swings out and it rests over that and it, what it does is it, it allows the the oxygen that has boiled off from the external tank to be vented away from the tank so that ice doesn't form on the tank. Okay. Oh, sorry. This is just the view looking down from the same spot. I, I assume that neither of you have a fear of heights. Um, not really. I don't think I would do well. You really can't there. have one. There have been people out there that have had fear of heights, and some people do develop it over time. Some think they don't, and they step out of the elevator, and it's all open grating, so you right. can see straight down. And once they're out there, there are numerous stories of people being absolutely terrified and diving back into the elevator. And Tavi I... would be just fine because she used to paint water towers. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> billboards. I have a, um, a question about this... Um... First of all, for people you know who've never even seen uh, any images or anything of a, a launch pad, and, and who may have never even seen a launch, um, can you explain the the deep area there, the trench there, uh, that's in between? I guess this is where the crawler comes up. Yeah, the crawler there. comes up. The crawler comes up, and this is what it goes on one side's over here, and the other tracks over here. So it actually straddles. This is the the flame trench. This is um, facing south, so the this is the, is where the main engine exhaust goes. And it's not really exhaust, but you see mostly water vapor coming from this side when the uh, it looks like smoke coming up. But it's directed away from the vehicle and up and away from the launch pad. And I just want to point out that the tracks right here are what the rotating surface structure rides on when it's rotated. It starts out over here when the uh, shell rolls out, and then it rolls completely around the other side of the pad so that it surrounds the whole shell. So you really, there's no, it protects from the weather. It allows the, uh, the payload, wherever that might be, to be installed in the vehicle. Um, if you can see, when it's rolled back into what they call a park position away from the vehicle, this platform right here, and this one right here actually connect. And that's how you get out to move on to the, this part of the RSS. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, now, now it's, it's you come out this way. So things change a lot when it, when it moves. You have to know where you're at and where you're going to go because you can't go the same way to get where you're going to go once it moves. I hope that answers everybody's question. <laughs> About that. It answers what? mine. Yeah, if we stay quiet, it means you probably answered it. Okay. <laughs> this was just a view looking at um, the other launch pad um, that was converted for Ares. So, and those are the, the enormous um, lightning protection towers. Aha, I was wondering what those are. You get a better sense of how tall they are compared to the pad in this picture. Yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> When you're actually on the pad, they don't look that much taller because you're so close to them. But they're, I believe they're just short of 700 feet tall. Wow. And this is just looking back at the VAB from up there on the tower. And you can see the LCC over here, the launch control complex. <clears throat> so is that where... Uh that's essentially where all of the uh, people responsible for the launch are at launch time? Yes. When you see the before launch, all the people running around and the, there's the, the media person that's talking about what's going on, they, they'll flash to a place inside like a control room. Mm -hmm. That's where they're looking, it's inside there. The firing rooms are inside here. 
And, and, and what is the tall building again? This is the that? vehicle assembly building. That's okay. where they, they mate the orbiter to the external tank and boosters and put it you know, in the vertical position so that it can be rolled out to the pad. Okay. Over here you can see this is um, orbiter processing facility Bay 3. And that's, that's one of the three that, that they process. Um, that one usually holds discovery. And it, will, it would roll out from there. You can't really see the track where it would it would go, but the other two are behind the the VAB. I just want to sense of size here for a second. The when the shuttle comes out of the VAB, it's about this tall, somewhere in there at the very top of it. When the Ares rocket came out, it was somewhere in this area. Mm -hmm. Wow. Now this this is a well, I think a fifty two story building to VAB, so almost to the top. Not quite as tall as Saturn V, I don't think, but it's just by a few feet. I think is the only difference. Yeah, the Saturn V didn't they have to assemble part of it after they rolled it out because it was so tall? I thought I remembered her. Yeah, answer. I think you're right. Maybe I don't. I'm not sure. And then this was just the view looking straight across from the level that we were on, looking directly at the external tank. And all these pictures are from the same level still. We're still on a 255-foot level of the tower. Okay. You can see the top of one of the solid rocket boosters right here. Mm -hmm. the, the beanie cap, the vent on, sits on top of here. And is, the vents, you can't see them there. They're on the north and south sides. But they have like little pockets, little shrouds inside that cap that that fit over and kind of seal the against the tank a little bit to make sure that all that uh, oxygen is vented away. This is the area that you probably saw on TV a lot when they had those um, gut leaks. Yes. Everybody saw those, I think. <laughs> and it's basically what that is, is just the plate, they call the gut, the ground umbilical Carrier plate. plate. It's basically what they, the plate, the plate itself will come off at launch. And what to do with the pad, they hook this hose. There's a small hose at the end there that actually connects to the plate with a bunch of little hoses and some wires and everything. So they have electrical and everything they need to tell what's going on inside the tank. It, it looks pretty simple, but it's, it's a lot more complex than you'd think. And this was just another view from the same area. You can see a little bit more of the um, lower levels there. You can see that what we were just looking at, that the gut area. I'm just looking at this and the complexity of it and trying to imagine Andy's first day on the job. <laughs> it, actually, the first time I went there was for the interview. They actually flew me out there. And it was like a second interview, and there was, I think it was Atlantis on the pad. And I got to go up there and, and take a little tour of what was going on. I think they knew they were going to hire me then, or they were going to offer me the job. So they took me a little tour of the pad while I was out there. And it was, it was something, because I, I'd always wanted to be either an astronaut or I wanted to dig dinosaur bones when I was little. So... Uh -huh. This was something really neat that I got the chance to be that close to it, even if it was just for an interview and for the day. But I got a chance to stand, you know, that close to the, the space shuttle. It was a really, yeah. it was a big deal. This was just one where I was taking a, a picture of the uh, scenery in the distance, the beach there. And there's an interesting. You um, shared a link with me that talked about the uh, the astronaut beach house. Yeah. That is an interesting little story about that, um, the purchase of that property. Yeah. And, uh, Isn't that? Yeah, and the subdivision that once existed, and they kept the house, that one house for a beach house. And um, uh, that's, a, that's an interesting little story about that property. Yeah, there's, I believe there's even some current um, space shuttle program employees whose families owned houses in that, that area. Um, either their grandparents or parents um, lived there at one time. 
So And they bought all of that property for thirty five thousand dollars. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Can you imagine today what it would be worth? No, not at all. And it, it's so beautiful. I, I got a chance to go to the astronaut beach house one time for a, an event, and you can walk down to the beach and look in either direction, and you can't you see nothing but just pristine beach. It's it's amazing. It's one of the few places, probably in Florida, where you can go where it's the beach is originally the way it was. It's yeah. No people have touched it at all. So it's as just as nature would have left it. It's, it's really a really place to go. And just this is another, another view. I love, view this. I love this shot. <laughs> it's beautiful. You can see kind of some of the interesting uh, lay of the land there with all the, all the strange waterways we have. So flat. <laughs> yeah, you don't that's realize what I like about it. There until you look at it from that high up, high up on the air, it, there's a lot of water and a lot. Of, most of that water is only a foot or two deep out there. This is looking south at one of the other launch complexes, and I'm not even certain which one. Do you know? I'm not sure. It, it may be the Atlas pad before it, the rocket rolled out. Um, because I know when the Atlas launches, they clear everyone from pads A and B. There are a few rocket, few launches that are that close that we are in the, the danger area, so we have to evacuate our everybody on the pad, you know, during a launch. Mm -hmm. So it, they, I'm not sure exactly which one that is, but there's a whole row of them going all down the beach. Of um, some of them are are old from uh, like Mercury and. Um, all the programs, um, and then there are the the ones that are for Atlas and some of the Delta newer ones. And and the ones they're building for the SpaceX has a, a pad out there, and there's there's a lot going on out there. There's quite a few um, towers and launch pads out there. Yeah. And are they doing anything with some of the older uh, pads, or are they available for just tours, or what? I, I'm not I, really sure. I don't know about tours. I mean, mm -hmm. I think they're, they're in use or they're completely shut down. Mm -hmm. There are some spots I've been to. One of the, I want to say it was one of the Mercury or Gemini pads. And there's not much left of it. There's just some concrete out there with a little plaque. Yeah, the, there's, there's a monument yeah, there. Yeah, there's not much there, but it's, you know, away from the, the normal missile row that, that's out there. Yeah. Um, this one was just a, just a picture of their... Uh, of the signage on that level, and and somebody's pair of binoculars over there yeah. on the left. Uh, yeah, yes. looks like it. Up there, they have people sit there and watch for birds, um, because there's there's been several problems with woodpeckers or vultures or whatnot landing on the external tank, and actually picking at the foam. Ooh. Not not to mention bats. Bats, <laughs> bats. but they have to uh, you know scare away the birds and, and protect the uh, the tank. Mm-hmm. And is that their job then? They just watch it, for birds? It's not their job. They have other things. They're also, they control access to the pads. They're kind of like, not security, but they, they check your badge and make sure access you're... Access control. Yeah, you are allowed to be there. So this is one of the additional things they do besides... Right. This is just another view and where you can actually see, um, which one is that? That is the uh, hydrogen sphere, where the uh, liquid hydrogen is stored um, out there. I think they usually keep, I'm trying to think, I want to say 850 to 900,000 gallons of liquid hydrogen in there when it comes up to launch time. It's a little bit. Yeah, I'll say. <laughs> this is just showing kind of the the maze of platforms and um, handrails and everything else up there. See the lat? There's a ladder coming up to this level here, and it's it's that's I think why they call it um why they call them pad rats because you're walking around a maze. 
you, you, it takes a while to learn what level you're on and where you have to go from where you're at to get where you want to go. It definitely takes it takes some time to, to learn your way around. And it reminds me so much of an aircraft carrier or a, a battleship down it, inside there. Oh, yeah. I, I think there's some more coming when we look down in through the uh, tower a little more, isn't there? Yeah. You take some, I think. You get more of that feel, man. This, us. this is us. <laughs> Although I see there's an addition. Uh, I took some creative license. <laughs> we have Miko added to us right here. Uh, same scenery, just get to see who we are. It's a little windy that day, but we're... Yeah, we were getting blown away a little bit. This is a part that I'm real familiar with, although not in this area. Um, this is uh, the forward reaction control system module right here. And this comes off and we take it down the road to um, the to where I work at the, the HMS and do um, processing on it there when, when it needs more than just um, a standard flows worth, like if a thruster needs to be changed or something like that. Can you give a basic background of what the uh, uh, the reaction control system is responsible for? It's for actually moving the craft once it is in orbit, correct? Yes, that's correct. It, it, the forward houses uh, 14 primary and 2 vernier thrusters, which the verniers are just little um, tiny thrusters that make minute adjustments. Um, they are oriented in different directions. You have the up firing, down firing, um, left and right. And um, it just uh, lets you maneuver. And that, that's how they dock to the, um, to the space station. That's how they do the, the deorbit burn, different things like that. And those, these on the forward work in the same, they work in concert with the ones that are on the ohms pods in the back, the two big bumps near the, on either side of the tail. And we'll get to those here. Yeah, we have some slide. pictures of those. This picture I took because Andy was telling me about this cable here. This, and there's, there's a little more to it below the frame, but, um, when uh, the payload comes out, it comes out in a big canister that, that really it looks just like the payload bay. It's the same size. The payload comes inside the can. It comes out vertical. And we don't have any pictures of this in the slideshow, but it comes out vertical and gets hoisted up into the same spot where the shell's payload bay would be. And there's two of these cables. They hook a big beam to it. That, and lower down to the pad surface. It's the uh, part of the 90-ton crane that's out there. And they actually pick up the whole the can and the payload and hoist it into place. This is this is the big cable that's you know, a part of the, I don't know, part of the hoist that, that actually hooks to the, the uh, um, when they have it lifted up in place, they hook these two cables to it, and that, it'll, that holds it in place until they can lock it down. And there are several places on throughout the pad that, that connections are made, and it's pulled against the, uh, the actual structure. Mm -hmm. and that way, it, it's seated just like the overs payload bay would be. And it has doors just like the, the payload bay doors, and it all acts exactly like that. So they can pull the payload out of that canister into the inside of the, the RSS, because it's, it's a big clean room inside there. Close all the doors back up, the can goes away, and then when the orbiter comes out, when the RSS swings around, it mates back with the uh, vehicle, and they can open the, the payload bay doors and put the, uh, the payload inside the vehicle. Okay. That was a very long description. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay, it was very good. We, we want to know. <laughs> This was just a view looking down, and it's kind of um, at the spot between the external tank and the the bottom of the orbiter. That's uh, like what we see on the uh, video camera during launch, right? Yeah, real, 
very similar um, angle and, and shot there. This is just a close-up view of the tiles. And if you uh, notice the little dots in the center, people have asked me before, is that, you know, how they're held in place? Is that where the hardware goes? And no, they're, they're actually bonded on, but the little, the little dots are holes where they inject uh, waterproofing solution into the tiles. So uh, somebody goes around and has to do that to every tile. It's a lot of tiles. It is a lot of tiles. And then this is just when we had, we went down to the next level and this was looking up. This was on the, if you mirror back a few slides, the top of the external tank, there was a flat surface behind the tank there. We're standing on that now, looking back at the uh, back at where we were standing before. Yeah, and we're we're put right here. We were standing about right, not right there. It's a little high, but the level right there is where we were standing. Mm -hmm. and we took those little shots. So in this, the um, the Gox vent arm I was telling you about, the whole arm, this the whole thing, starting back at the pivot point over here, it swing pivots from there, swings out over the top of the tank, and. That's where we, you know, before the... Uh, beanie cap is over here. And right. that's just, you can see kind of now the level that we were standing on right here. And it's just a diff slightly different perspective. What is this? Um, oh, it's gone now. Oh, you want to go back? <laughs> yeah, I'm curious about um, to the left there of the man standing there, that white thing. That's it, it, it's one of the many, many cameras. Okay. Had. I thought it looked like one. All right. Yeah, there's a lot of them out there. And this is just a real, um, right close up to the external tank. It's a beautiful thing. <laughs> <laughs> it is, isn't it? <laughs> Very orange. Yeah. Everybody always asks about these things right here. Tavi and I were talking about it, making <laughs> guesses. It was to it's scare a, the birds away. Is what yeah, guess it's, it's an owl, and I don't think they work, but <laughs> still use them. <laughs> we try everything we can to scare the birds away. But... <laughs> I don't think they really do anything, but they're an interesting conversation piece. You would think a launch would scare most animals away, but I guess they have bad <laughs> memories. Wouldn't you? Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, no. Um, these are the slide wire baskets, and Andy can tell you a lot more about those. Um, this is the this level is the 195 foot level. This is where the astronauts behind us is where the astronauts actually get onto the the over their the arm and the the white room. We we'll get to that in a little bit. But if they have to, you try to escape the vehicle for any reason, um, while it's the pad while they're still on it, they. Run over here, you hop in the basket, and there's a little paddle on each one of the baskets that they hit, and it slides down to, you see in the very back, there's a sandy area down there. So it's all the way down there, where they stop, where it hits a, a net, and it slows them down, stops them. They hop out, and there's a bunker that's right there, right to the left of that, uh, that they would run into, and there's flashlights and a place to hook up their, their, uh, the pressure suit to breathing air and everything they need to stay in there while something's happening. Or if they can get out, there's a small armored personnel carrier that they can get into and actually drive away from the pad. Well, that's amazing. Now, I guess during a launch when this would be used, they're pretty much the only people there. Am I right about that? I mean, that really... The, yeah, well, the astronauts, once they get there, the closeout crew... The ones that are helping them in their the rest of their suits and their parachutes and getting them actually set in place in the vehicle. Um, so there's usually about seven of those, and then you know lately seven astronauts. So you can fit three per basket, and there's seven baskets. Mm -hmm. So. And I would imagine part of their when they're preparing for their um, for everything, they probably do a run through on this particular scenario. They do exactly they do a couple of different run-throughs. They get to watch a basket slide down 
just like it would happen if they were in it. Um, we put as much weight in a basket as, you know, about three people's worth of weight in the basket and let it go. And they can watch it and hear what it sounds like and see what happens to it on the other end. And then when they're doing their, what they call a terminal countdown demonstration test, their, their practice run of the launch, at the end of what would be the T0 or launch time, they'll get out of the vehicle, they come over in their suits with helmets and everything, they get they all get in the basket, and the baskets are tied up so they can only go about a foot, but they get to hit the paddle and just to be in there to see what it's like. So they get to practice, but no one ever really gets to ride down, at least at full speed. Mm -hmm. in the not necessarily a theme park ride is what you're trying to say. No, you can make it about, they say about from the top of the tower down to the thing in about 18 seconds. Wow. I think is what it is. It's pretty fast. <laughs> That's just another view. You can see a, a better um, view of the side of what the baskets look like. And the, in this picture, the, the signs say they're locked. And usually they're not locked. Usually they're not just for the astronauts. It's for, they're for any kind of... Uh, pad emergency if someone's up there and has to get out the pad quickly. But what was going on, they were, they groomed the area down there at the, where the slide wires go. They leveled the sand out nice so that if anyone has to get out there, there's no tripping hazards or anything out there and everything is working fine. So they can't, they have to lock them um, just to make sure nothing accidentally happens while people are down there uh, working on the landing area. This is just a cabinet on that level, and I'm not even sure what's in there. There's, uh, I think there's one of those chairs that you can fold up, little wheeled chairs that the, the that's what it's even called. If you have to, there's a like a sled that you could put some, like an orange stretcher kind, stretcher of, thing. kind of thing that you could put someone in. It, you know, medical rescue kind of stuff that if someone's really hurt, you can, you know, hopefully put them in that and get down the stairs if, if it has to. And that's the level there, one, the 195 foot level. You come and you'll see this, just so you hear, coming from this area right here, um, to your left is the over access arm where the astronauts go out, and then they would come out and they would follow the, uh, we call it the yellow brick road, either way, because a lot, mo if, if it something happens, the, with the fire exit system, which is the, it's just a lot of water in a hurry. It's a water deluge system. So it's going off probably going off and in order to see where you're going the grading's painted so you can just follow the arrows on the grading and get you to where you need to be. And that takes you right over to those slide wire baskets that we just looked at. And this is looking down towards the white room. And this the over access arm like we're just saying where we were at before. Um, this is where they are. you see the astronauts are out right out here and then down that walkway and other end of those little doors down there is the uh, hatch to the shuttle. And here's inside the white room. You see the hatch and the, what, what all goes on. And there wasn't anything going on in there. It was actually closed when we took these pictures. There was no one in the vehicle. The vehicle was powered down. Yeah, we took them through the window because it was, it was closed out. But it looks bigger than it really is. It's really not that big. <laughs> oh, and what is the yellow, the yellow tube, that big yellow tube for? That's um, for um, the air, for the environmental. Just, just air circulation. In so that it's not stuffy and um, gases don't build up in there. It's just um, okay. airflow. Okay. And this is just a close-up of the little bench um, leading into it. They had a little sign just for the mission on there. Yeah, that make, one, make one for every, every mission. Yeah, that, I found that kind of interesting. You know, it's kind yeah. of a, a badge uh, for each <laughs> mission, you know. Yeah. With most of these, I don't know if, if it's this particular one or they make more than one, but in our conference room, in our building, the, on the walls, the walls are covered. One wall is completely covered with the shuttle missions that, that fly off of that particular pad. Mm -hmm. Pad B has the same thing. Every single launch is going off of Pad A has one of these plaques hanging in the conference room. Hmm. We've also got them for the all the uh, Apollo flights that went off of Pad A also. 
And this is just showing you a um, little bit different view. You can see some of the things in that room. I think this is probably a very familiar image for everybody. Yeah, yeah if you watch it on TV when they when the astronauts are are being loaded in there, then you've probably seen this. And then we had to take our pictures, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Why not, right? Yep. This is looking down at the base of the solid rocket boosters. And this is something that I didn't even know about when I went up there. Um, what they're working on, which is the water bags. The, the water bags are there um, after STS-1. Um, they had a lot. They had a lot of damage to the back side of the orbiter when it came back. And what they figured out it was um, the acoustic vibration of the the engines going off, bouncing back from the flame trench, and that that vibration, that noise actually rattled off quite a few tile. So what they, I guess they figured out, I don't know how they did it, but this better than me, but all the water deluges there and the water bags are there to dampen the sound as it comes back up at launch. And they're not there very long, but I guess it, it, they're long enough that it cuts down that vibration, you know, significantly. Split second, maybe. And this, the entire trenches down here get filled with these bags. This was just the beginning of, of them installing them, is what we saw here. Um, That's absolutely amazing. I've seen the, isn't it like a little pond out? It's not a little pond. That where the water deluge is, uh, is that the, for the runoff or is that for the actual water storage? It's for the runoff. That okay. water storage is in the water tower. Well, that makes sense. And those are O-rings on the uh, on the solid rocket booster. Those are well, you can't see the, the actual O-rings like I think you're just thinking about. Okay, it's just I'm not sure if that's if the the rings where they're attached. They put foam over them um, to cover them up. I think just for aerodynamic reasons or you know just to protect them. There's a lot of extra foaming that goes on, and then they get painted all the way around. So just to I think it's a waterproofing and a, you know, any corrosion and probably quite a few other things that, that I haven't heard of yet. <laughs> this is a wonderful shot to show the expanse of the uh, Kennedy Space Center. I mean, just look in the distance there. Yeah, it's, that's some some of the um, other launch pads, right? Yeah, like that's the one that we yeah. had looked at closer up before, and there's there's different launch complexes all along there. All the way down through the Air Force side, it's, it's, it's a long road of them. Yeah, oh. quite a few. And this is Andy talking about his system. And this is part of the, the, the valve complex that um, when we service the, the fuel cell tanks, we put liquid hydrogen oxygen inside the vehicle. It has nothing to do with the, the external tank at all. This, this is what's inside the vehicle that the fuel cells use to produce electricity. Um, and this is part of the, the servicing system for that. Um, you'll see, I think, in the next couple of slides, you'll see where that goes. It goes up one level from there and attaches to the vehicle. There's a big plate, and all the hoses go in, and there are, there are five tank sets, five hydrogen tanks and five oxygen tanks. Each one has its own fill and vent hose so that they can... You know, we actually this is what's going to go on tomorrow. If everything goes right, they'll be using this to put the uh, cryogenics inside the vehicle. And then that there's this is another view um, and this back is, farther. There's yeah. the plate that we were just looking at here. Yeah, everything in yellow moves. It slides forward and back so that it comes back all the way, uh, so it's out of the way when the the orbiter gets there, and we rotate the arse around it. Uh, and we, it takes us about an hour to roll it forward and, and actually do all the connections to it to get it hooked up. It looks more complicated than it really is. It, there's a lot of little handles and valves and things, but it's, it's really nothing. I, I was just looking at all those little valves and <laughs> wondering about that. 
it just that panel actually controls um, that plate uh, up and down. Really, is what it controls. We can make fine adjustments to the up and down to make sure that it's lined up exactly with the orbiter, so it gets, everything goes on straight. This is just another shot looking back at the um, at pad B where um, Ares launched from. And then this is a shot of the scenery, and maybe you can tell us about that. Yeah, that is the, uh, what we call the perk pond. The square pond on the left is where the runoff, there's two of those, after launch and all the water that comes out, and all the the water we use to wash the whole pad down afterwards goes in there. And they check the pH level of it and treat it to make sure it's it's acceptable. And then they used to just let it go off into the, the swamp. But now they, they pump it out into that pond. And there's some sprinklers. You see the row of them right down the middle. There's some sprinklers that go out, and it goes into the, it fills this pond up, and it, it soaks in or evaporates away instead of just letting all the water and it booster residue, whatever, go into the swamp. So it, it keeps keeps it a little nicer and doesn't mess with the environment around us as much. And this was. This was uh, down where the external tank connects to the orbiter. Um, behind, not this part, but behind there a little bit is a, a few bigger pipes. They call it the 17-inch the disconnect that were actually the, the fuel goes from the external tank into the orbiter to you, for, you know, at launch. Here is one of the booster, you see the solid rocket booster up in the upper left hand corner there. Um, they're each basically held in place by four bolts. So there's eight bolts that hold this thing onto the MLP, and that's really it. Um, they're substantial things, but there's really still only eight bolts that hold this thing. And, and how are they How are they ejected? Are those explosive bolts or? Yes. Right at ignition, they explode. and, I'm, and Well, it's, there's a frangible nut. Yeah. And the nut has, um, it's like it's split in half and it has these two charges on either side of it. And those make the two halves separate. And there's a something, there's a bolt catcher too. Something that catches the pieces so that they don't cause any damage. Wow. And these are just the people that were working to fill the water bags underneath. It's, a, it's about a day's worth of work. It's, it's a little complicated because certain bags have to go in certain places so they all fit together because some of the cords run through other bags. So you have to make sure you have the right bag in the right spot or, you know, it's not going to go together right. That was a picture right off the side of one of the boosters. This is one of my favorite photos. <laughs> there is just something. It, in fact, it reminds me of, of something. I, I think on uh, Twitter today, um, somebody was asking about what it's like to work on it. Do you still find it amazing? And you said something about it. Um, it's being di it's different when you work on it, but that ultimately ends up with a, a f with a familiarity and pride at launch. And this is kind of a you know kind of just a it's a nomenclature on top of something that most people who aren't really even you know, serious enthusiasts of the space program are all familiar with socket ro uh, solid rocket boosters, and this just makes it kind of generic almost. It's just amazing. Yeah. You know, just like I could pull that part number off and put it into a web form and order one. Yeah, <laughs> sure. Order a couple. <laughs> well, you have your own train track coming through your backyard. Yeah. Right? <laughs> and you got to assemble it yourself. <laughs> Some assembly required. Some, yeah. That would be a good shot if somebody put that up as a goof. <laughs> <laughs> this is another um, shot of that 17 inch disconnect area that we were looking at before you can just get a um, d little bit different perspective of it yeah if you if you see at, at launch you'll see the pictures of the uh, external tank and the ones they show immediately afterwards there's a camera when this thing detaches there's two doors there that are open when it the tank releases there's cameras inside there. Before the doors close, they're snapping pictures of the of the tank, and you'll see on the bottom where there's some structure pointing up, you know, at the at the vehicle, and that's what you're looking at. It's the back end of the, the tank. 
It's just more people working on the water bags. <laughs> and all those pipes around them are part of the uh, sound suppression system, the sound suppression water. We'll have different pictures of that as we go along, think through here. Um, but where all the water comes up and spills out on top of the, the MLP deck and underneath, it all runs through those pipes. It's a lot of water. <laughs> this is just up at uh, that level we were on looking down. And is that one of the... That's one of the bolts. This yeah. is one of the attached bolts where, that holds the um, booster down there. Okay, here we are looking up from the the same side, the same place we're looking at the uh, the disconnect down there. Um, looking up, and you can see where we were at before. Um, when we were looking down, we were at that little platform right over here. We were right. We were standing on this platform looking down. That's where the other shot is. Looking down, we're standing there looking down. We are on, um, and there's some, I think there's another picture of this later on. Right immediately to the, the on left side of your screen there is, is the orbiter weather protection. It's a big curtain wall that swings out from the tower um, to protect the, the wing and, and, you know, anything else from any weather or hail or, or whatnot. And the walkway we're standing on right there actually swings around all the way to the other side of the tower. And, and stows there, and that that wall that's that's back, like you see behind me there, um, sits flush up against the tower, so it's all flat and out of the way. Yeah, launch time. Here you can see the the whole tr um, trench thing here. That this is all filled up with those water bags side by side when they're completed. I'm still trying to understand the water bags. Like this, we have the, those three, the red stripe, the red stripe, and the yellow stripe. Is, are each one of those a big water bag? Yeah, each, yeah. each one is its own bag. And the, the only reason they're color-coded is the yellow ones go around the booster, and the red ones are just the ones that line up um, in, the, in the main hole. Okay. And it's when they're filled up, the red go all the way out. I posted a picture on... Uh, Twitter yesterday with the full installation. Okay. We'll have to get that to you. And they, the bags, it looks like they have baffles in them here to um, kind of keep the water yeah. compartmentalized a little bit. Here's a really good shot of the uh, the hold down bolts um, right there. You see this side. And, and this side has these little red hoods on this side uh, because it launched the the whole vehicle actually, let's we'll say, walks, but moves that direction. About well, we have pictures of the we might the, the, the deck, but you can see where it. The main burn marks are actually here. They're about thirty feet, you know, to your left, because hmm. it walks that far before it, it actually gets high enough off the uh, off the deck. We might have a picture of that. Kind of, you can kind of see it right, see it there, right, right in here. But you can't get perspective on right, how Right, because you can't see how at. far away it is but here. That right there is a sprinkler. Um, one of several that are on the zero level. Um, there's a good picture of the water tower. Yeah, you can see the water tower and where the supply comes from comes that. Through. There are more pictures of that I think, later on. Yeah, there's better so. pictures there. <laughs> Um, okay, looking down from where we're at there. I'm not sure. This is looking down at the zero level, though. Probably about the 135 foot level, I think, of the tower is what it looks like to me. What um, where we were? Where we were standing, uh, looking down. Probably after we walked off the, uh, the weather protection there, just looking down at the the, the zero level of the peak, which is what they call the uh, the top deck of it. And there's me. Yeah, there's 
next side of me. She was fascinated with the water bags. I've so never a, seen those. Of, I've never seen the water bags before. It's interesting how you can see right here how the um, the connections to get around um, the boosters here, how they have to um, go through the other bags. Mm -hmm. I, I, to this point, uh, up until this point, never knew there were water bags. I knew of that the sound suppression system, but I did not realize that they actually had to architect this because of the what must be significant vibrational energy. Yeah. I'm with you. I just learned about it. What was that Wednesday? <laughs> yeah, it, it takes uh, four or five hours. They don't come perfectly assembled. You got, there's some assembly required of the water bags too before they even bring them out to the pad to get them ready. There's some strings have to be tied to the end that actually hooks them around the uh, the MLP itself to get everything ready to you know, all those cords tied on. <laughs> they Sorry. Must, they must not like this section of the slide. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Keep going here. Okay, here we come down to. Well, this is the left wing. Yeah, obviously. you can kind of recognize where you are from the, the NASA meatball there on the wing. Kind of gives you a little size perspective with the guy there. You yeah. See how, how big the thing really is when you're standing right next to it. And then there's that guy. <laughs> These are his feet. He's in, I love that shot. <laughs> he's in there work, doing some work. No, uh, he's asleep. <laughs> you never know. He could be. You just got there, so I think. I, I think he, it's safe to say that he was he was doing some work. <laughs> and these are the these are the little booties that um, you wear over your shoes in there, so that you don't bring any dirt and contaminants in the vehicle. Or she'll leave them in the vehicle. Right. And it's, I don't know, uh, a lot of people have heard of or seen bunny suits that are worn um, in the orbiter a lot of times. Mm -hmm. He didn't have to wear that because he, the work that he's doing is in the aft section, which is not an area that the crew goes in. Um, so the shoe, per, the, you know, they want the shoes to be kept clean, but it's not, you know, as critical because you're not um, leaving particulate that the crew might breathe in or that might screw up um, instruments so it's not as much of a problem there close up <laughs> close up of course and these you can see here some of the um, these are the thermoformed covers that protect um, some of the lines that are in there um, those all of that stuff has to be taken out before launch there's a whole big trailer full of stuff that comes out of the vehicle as they're getting ready to they call it closing it out as you're closing the door for final time for flight there's a lot of little platforms and ladders and covers a lot of things inside there there's a lot of stuff inside there just to make it so you can get around and do whatever needs to be done inside there this yellow thing that he's on right there that's a, a platform and then this is like a cushion on top of that so it's not so hard to lay on and everything's got a label and a number on it everything yeah does. they know exactly what's in there you know where it's at yeah there are logs that have everything that's put in and they have to be cleared when it's taken out that's me and that door that we were looking in is right over here I love that shot that's a nice shot you gotta go for the meatball shot there yeah <laughs> This is just an interesting perspective shot. I think you probably recognize most of the components there. This is the other side from where we were just looking at. Um, same thing, but opposite. They generally go into the other side. That's where the, the normal access is. But this side, if there's a there's a access control monitor, like the one that was on top, um, what's for birds, they sit in a little booth. And if you're going to actually go inside the vehicle, you have to stop there. And you'll give them your badge and anything that's in your pockets, and you'll make a list of the tools that you have that you're going to take in with you, so that when you come out, every you can inventory everything and make sure you everything you went in with, you came back out with. So they control freight tight, so they just go through one to one door usually. 
And then what you had the little pointer over there by that window or door? This? Yeah. Is it's that a, it's a clear um it's just a, a temporary door that's used during processing. Okay. That gets taken off and they put a real door on there that's solid. And they call it a door. It's, it's not a door it's like you think. It's, it's just a it's just a kind of a panel. It's but, a hatch or but everything hole. everything goes on there they call it a door. <laughs> so uh, That's true. They do. And that's looking up from the other side there. You see can the, see a lot of the maze of um stairways and, and the structural conduit that's there just it holds it all together that little spider web right there to my side there it, it, I, I still look and, and sometimes push up high and just look down through the whole little maze and everything and, and you know it's so complicated I know. I was thinking about the design of it and the, the, the people who actually designed this I, I was thinking the same thing yeah, and and is this still? I remember at one at one time this this shuttle was considered to be the most complex machine on the planet. Um, I think it still is. Yeah, and I think you can see why. Yeah. There's a lot of things, a lot of things that go into getting this thing ready to launch. I mean, a lot of stuff. You can kind of see here how well protected the orbiter itself is, because it's underneath all of this. Like the slanted part protects the wings from anything that might fall mm -hmm. and it's it's almost completely enclosed in there until they roll that part out so they rotate it out yeah. um just prior to launch or what a day before or so yeah for this launch it'll be sunday night is when it'll come away so usually 18 hours something like that somewhere in that, that vicinity before launch when it rolls back. So it's it's pretty well protected in there though. And if you go inside there, these are this is one of the Ohms pods here, the orbital maneuvering system pods. And, and we there's, there's more pictures. Yeah, you know, you know, you'll be able to see it better. More. That is the vertical stabilizer or tail. Looking down. Looking down. <laughs> down towards the ground. And you'll be able to see a different view of this um, with this yellow um, guard here later. We'll point that out when we get to view it from the side. And here. This is, um, this is the last thing to unhook before launch. This is where all the electrical systems and gas systems, all the instrumentation, everything um, goes into the vehicle. This is what's on the the, um, the tail service mass, the TSMs on MLP, the two big two-story buildings on either side of the shell where it's on the pad. Big gray lump kind of things yeah. that, that reach up towards the wings of the orbiter if, yeah. you, if you see it. And this is where the this is actually also where the how the tank is fueled. Um, the liquid hydrogen oxygen that goes in the external tank actually flows through the orbiter to get to the tank. There's no other connection but the orbiter to that. So it flows all through the orbiter to fill the tank up. So these are known as the T zero umbilicals. And um, right, and and right don't they at, just they just disconnect when it launches, right? Yeah, they, they just get, blow off, there's, right? There's, there's pyros inside the TSM that, at booster ignition, they blow, and there's some weights in there that suck those plates back in a hurry. And there's a big door that slams down on top of them, a blast door, to protect them from the, uh, you know, the exhaust plume as it goes up. This is looking... Um straight at the vertical stabilizer between the two ohms pods here. One thing I'll point out just, just real quick is, is, is those three streamers there on either side, mm -hmm. those are the APU um, exhaust ports. When you see it land, you might see some little puffs of smoke or something come out of the back of the, the orbiter um, while it's on the runway. That's what it, that's what it's coming out of. 
Um, the so APUs are there to, for hydraulic power and such. Auxiliary power units. So, yeah, thanks. <laughs> and that's what that's where it's coming from. That's why that little puff of smoke or something. You can see it especially on when they do the thermal imaging of the when it comes back in. You can see it puffing a lot more. That's what that is. This is looking in where we saw the um, the guy's feet before. <laughs> you can yeah. see them in there. And it doesn't look like he's sleeping. <laughs> no, like of course sleeping. not. <laughs> <laughs> and then that's um, stepped back from that same view. And we're looking at um, one of the Ohm's pods is right here. Here is the aft the back part of the wing. Um, the left-hand wing. This is the, the flight, actually the arrow surfaces on the back. Um, like the ailerons on a plane. Um, yeah. The guy to control it while it's in the atmosphere. And not so much on the way up, but mostly on the way down. <laughs> yeah. And then this access was to what? Um, the service thing, the auxiliary power units, there's uh, hoses that we run down there and disconnect and hook to the, the, the vehicle to service, uh, put the hydrogen fuel um, for those, those other power units. That's where that goes at. Okay. This is a closer view of that area we looked at before with the tracks at the very beginning. And one of these little vehicles. They're, they're tugs like for like towing airplanes. Mm -hmm. Only they'll, uh, we'll, we'll get to a, a couple more slides, I think, um, what they, they're there for and what they move around. So I'll, I'll point that out when we get there. Okay. I love the lights, the Christmas tree over there. I mean, I mean, I don't know what it really is, but it makes me think of a drag strip in the Christmas tree. Uh -huh. Oh, the, like, uh, the yeah. lights there. <laughs> the stadium lights, what we call them. There's yeah. five of those around there, and those are the general lighting, you know, blah, blah. Yeah. Another one of our, the, that's operation support building. Right here. That. And I work inside there. And this is where you come through when you um, access the pad, and there's a turnstiles here and badge rack. Yeah, everyone, when they come in, everyone has to leave some sort of badge in the rack. So if there is an emergency and we have to evacuate, someone goes and collects all those badges. So that way, and they hand them back out. So whoever the badge is left means that person is still inside the pad and we they need to go figure out where they're at. And, right. And, it's, and, it's just an accountability system. That's also used in the orbiter processing facilities. More of just the... Uh, just that same area. And you can see the, the, the RSS. What, what is this no parking over there? Right there. <laughs> that, that is where the... the RSS trucks. They're little, it's like little, I don't know what, how you would call it. It's uh, it's the wheels of the RSS. They uh -huh. sit in between these little points right there, the locks. So they just don't want to park it in the middle of between them. I'm not, okay. not sure why exactly, but there's no parking. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, uh, that looks like what, high crew there? Yeah. And this is they're the they're the ones that um when we have places that we need to access that are not accessible, they um will build scaffoldings and install um access platforms and do all the rigging at heights for um technicians to be able to get to where they need to get to. Here is the um, the bottom of the um, the ohms pods. This is one of what we call the um, ohmies, which is the orbital maneuvering engines. It's not the the main um, it's not the main ones that you see the SSMEs or space shuttle um, main wow. engines. These are smaller, and if you see the orbiter, you'll see the big um, three SSMEs, and then these two. Um, much smaller ones on top. And then this is the area of the Ohm's pod um, known as the stinger. 
and it's just basically a piece of the structure that holds all of the thrusters that are on that pod. And that's one of the thrusters that kind of sticks out a little bit here. And these are these are where the thrusters are. They're covered up by um, these metal covers. And then they have um, a purge going to them um, with a, a desiccant to keep it, keep it dry and and also the desiccant changes color to indicate if there's been if there's any um, toxic vapors. <laughs> this is one of the SSMEs. You can see it next to. It's substantially bigger. Yeah. Next to the uh, the Omi there. That's a real good view there of one of the um, stinger areas of of a pod shows all the the different thrusters and how they're oriented this is one of the vernier thrusters here you can see how yeah, that is a really good i never have been able to visualize what it is you work on until just now <laughs> we'll have to send you some more pictures because i <laughs> have some much better views it's hard to explain any of this unless somebody can actually stand there and you can point to it or like this one you can you can show pictures because it's it's hard to explain in a way that, that people yeah. know can picture what you're talking about. It is. It's very difficult. This is just another view of the SSMEs here. This is what part of the... That's part of the vertical. The vertical stabilizer. I love that. I just want to reach out and touch it. It sounds corny, but, you know, it's the shuttle, and you just want to reach out and touch it. Everybody wants to touch it. And then they would have yeah. to send in a whole crew to inspect where you touched. It depends on where you're touching it. You're not, you're not supposed to touch tiles and all that, but there's a lot of the stuff that we work on on the, the pods that it's okay to touch. So just depends on where you are. And this is a, is a rather complicated shot. <laughs> yeah. This is actually when they're when you when they talk about doing the uh, hyper gall loading of the vehicle. Um, what they're doing is loading that forward reaction control pod mm -hmm. and the two almost pods on the back. Well, this all this apparatus is just part of where that fluid goes or comes from and goes into the back of the the pod right here. There's a all the hoses come out here, and there's a bunch of disconnects there that are, are made and mounted to the vehicle that in the fluid lines. So comes up through these skids, through the, all the hoses, and up into the vehicle. From there are little buildings on the outs outskirts of the pad that that house it. They're storage farms they call them. So that's that's all that what it does is basically the fuel, the internal fuel for the the vehicle. Here's the um, the other side. This is the other pod. Same thing, stinger. More pictures, different ways. You can see some of the platforming and some of the other stuff that goes on. There's, you know. This is the this inside is, of one of the tail service masts. See how they, the door, when they close the door, how what it takes to make sure the door stays closed. It's got a... Yeah. Mechanism. Now, when that sign says ordinance installed, which ordinance are they talking about? The, the, what, the ordinance that explodes inside the TSM that will allow the T0, T0 umbilical. Care, yeah, come, umbilical plate. So that umbilical plate we saw earlier. Yes. yes. So there, it's in there. It, it may or may not be connected electrically, but the ordinance is inside, so you don't go really there so, messing around. It's a warning. This is um, when we were looking down at the vertical stabilizer or the tail, and I, we should saw that yellow thing. That's this here. That's basically so that you don't bump your head into and damage the tiles on yeah. this tail right there. You know, I, I see that remove for launch sign on a number of the slides, and it always yeah. reminds me of like when I buy a computer printer and it has all those things inside of it you have to remove, and if you forget one. And it gives you a new respect for, like you were saying, taking a log of everything that's on there, that everything, that has to be a nerve-wracking job. Yeah, they're not, these aren't necessarily a log. What they do is they color code them. So 
on the MLP zero level, anything orange, you can just look at. If it's orange, it gets removed at some point. It has to be gone at launch time. So you're not really writing it down, but it's just you look over and there's nothing orange, you know you're okay. Yeah, no, I see exactly what you mean. Here's the bottom side of the SSMEs, and we couldn't go up in there because they were doing some kind of something. Something that they don't, it's not usually done. I'm not sure what it was exactly. Some kind of a purge that could have caused an oxygen deficient atmosphere. So Something. So usually, that could have been a bummer. Yeah. Yeah. Usually you can get pictures right up underneath there. It's a, it's a weird feeling standing there with the engine bell over the top of your head. Yeah, uh, especially it's, when you think about what it looks like when it, when those ignitions go off. Yeah, it's a it's a, it's a strange feeling when you're standing there, and it's you know you, you know where you're at and what happens at a certain point. And just like tell you, look, all these platforms that are here, all of that. And I don't feel a good picture of the uh, the hole, but all of that gets lowered down and is gone. It gets lowered down and, and taken away. I think there's a picture. We might have later, a picture of, later. Of where, of where that gets lowered onto and. and where it goes. These um these engine bells here too, they have really uh neat acoustics. So if you get to stand in one and you talk it's it's got a really neat um echo yeah, to if it. If you're in the right spot, it, it don't make it too loud a noise because it I've done that and I was talking to it and I was in the right spot and it's if you're too loud, <laughs> it comes back to you as loud or or quite a bit louder. Which is what you would expect from a rocket nozzle. It's it's a, it's a big thing. <laughs> I mean, in terms of having to be able to reflect and focus all of that energy out to the pad. Mm-hmm. Your bottom side of the, the feet, I guess you could call them. I, I always thought <laughs> it was feet. I, you know, I, always, I still think I'm that way uh, of the boosters. It, he, it does look like um, from that side. You'll see in a, a couple more pictures. It, it reminds me of like a robot. Me too. <laughs> yeah, if it was yellow, 60s. it would actually look like Big Bird kind of. But <laughs> <laughs> it, does, it does actually. You're right yeah. Uh, this just this is the um, pipe with the uh, water for the yeah the for the sound bands. suppression yeah. system there, and then just people doing some work. This is a communications box here. These are sprinklers, I believe, right? For that sound, yeah, I sound think suppression system. I, these. These may be more uh, fire egg stuff, water deluge, uh, in case of a, you know, probably a, a, an aborted launch, something that would come on to, to soak everything down just to make sure that, you know, no fire, nothing nothing happened afterwards. They're take like a big fire hose nozzle. And they're covered up so that somebody doesn't bump into them and hurt themselves. And you can see they're orange, so obviously they're, you know. Those get removed. <laughs> There's a nice view that makes it look like a robot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's a great shot there. I like that. <laughs> Just uh, you can see the um, body flap of the the orbiter here with all the tiles on it, kind of sticking down below. And or here, these right here where it separates here, this is part of that um, weather protection, or both of them are. This piece here slides out all the way over to here, and then this whole wall slides back against the tower. And then this side is just the curtain wall slides all the way back so it's not, you know, out of the way. So all the pieces out there really... When it's all around it, you really have a hard time even seeing any part of the vehicle mm. when, it's, uh, when it's out there all covered up. This is the base of the water tower here, and the the connections where that that comes up. And those go up through the pad. There's another picture of them on where they're. They come up into the uh, inside the NLP, run through the mobile launcher, and up out of the launcher. There's some pipes that are about four feet around inside the launcher that you have to kind of duck around and, and you know dodge. Um, they carry the water to the, the surface there. This is that walkway that we were looking at before um, that goes to the GUP area. Yeah. 
And then this is the access arm yep. right here that goes to the white room that we saw before where the, or, where the astronauts board. Yeah, where the little um, the mission plaque was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is underneath. Here's the top, the peak of the flame trench that we were, we were looking at before. And mm -hmm. you can see the SRB holes. That These go are those the, holes where the water bags were mm -hmm. This is the bottom side of them. You can see the pipe there that, that puts the water up into the, on the MLP service and through the MLP. It comes from the uh, the water tank, the water tower. And these are like big sprinkler heads here, right? Mm -hmm. You can see that it's it's kind of checkerboard pattern. Every time, especially recently, every launch, some of that gets blown away. Um, so they have contractors come in and they cut away part of it until they get the, the you know cut away all the loose stuff, and they put it back in patches. And they, it's a sprayed kind of like a kind of like you do your pool, something similar to that. They'll they they spray it all on there and it hardens. They don't they don't actually pour it. Here's up here. Right there is what we were looking at underneath the uh, the main engines nozzles, those platforms. And they get that whole thing gets lowered down out of that hole onto it's right out of frame in this in this picture, but right here it's it's on wheels on this on the tracks. It gets lowered down onto that and then it gets um, towed by those tugs we saw earlier um, down the slope toward the pad support building. It sits about halfway down. There's like little stops right there that it rests on. Here, this is what this is is the MLP sits on pedestals at the pad. Well, when it gets there, there are pins, big, I think about four or five inch round pins by about maybe a foot long on the bottom of the MLP. Um, they go into a socket on the pedestal. Well, all those pins are not exactly alike on every launcher. So what this does is a big chain that wraps around here and it goes down this this little eye here and the whole, it's like a strut. It turns and actually moves that pedestal a little bit side to side to get perfectly lined up with that particular launcher. Wow. It's not an easy job either. I've done that and it's, it's a, it's a you got to ratchet with about a five or six foot handle on it um, wow. to get it to move. Here's in that same um, hole that's underneath the boosters and these are where the water comes out. There's, I see another part. And water comes out everywhere on that thing. So that's just right underneath where and it all helps dampen the, the sound. This is just, we were standing over on this side, the other side before. This is looking from the other direction. This is the SRB part of the flame trance. And you can see the, the transporter right there that the, all the platforms sit on. And you can see the platform that's on top of it right there is, there's two of one on the other side you can't see, but those came out of the, the, the booster holes. And that's the platforms that, for access to underneath the booster to work on it. They've been taken out already. Um, on either side there, you see, these are the uh, main flame deflectors. And they ride on different little tracks that are on either side of the flame trench. And those tugs also pull those into position and they get locked in place. It just focuses the, the SRB exhaust down into the flame trench instead of it you know, going out either side of the pad service there and messing anything up. Yeah, and even with that, you still have a lot of, uh, you have a lot of residual uh, force it's probably coming out all over the bottom anyhow. Oh yeah. But it does do a good job of focusing most of it into the in the trench. Here's here's those tracks I was telling you about, the, the one on the left there and then right to our right on the other side of those uh the orange poles here, there's another track and the it all the all that stuff the the transporter that holds the all the access platforms and the uh, main flame deflector ride on that those rails 
Um, they move them back and forth depending on what's going on and where they need to be. Tell them about the the clips and the well the plywood. Oh, 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 that, oh, those clips. Okay. Um, well, those aren't these some of the clips. Those oh, okay. Are the ones that hold. Uh, back further, I don't have a picture of those, but when the crawler comes out, they put plywood all over this concrete. And I'm not sure exactly if it's to protect the, I think it's to protect the crawler shoes, um, the metal crawler shoes uh, from the concrete in the steel and pad surface. Um, it gives kind of a cushion, but there's plywood, uh, three quarters pieces of plywood, you know, all up on, on top of there. So let's crawl or drive on. It's just looking back. We were we walked through here and just looking back up. See the flame deflectors and the different uh, pedestals that LP's sitting on. Yeah, and, these pedestals here. And you can see. Yeah, the I like this shot. You can see the other side we were looking at before. Okay. Point. We were looking at it, it, not this particular one, but one on the other side. I was telling you about how the, the strut moves. It's a big strut hooked to the pedestal, and it moves it side to side like this to get it straight. There's also a little like a little turnbuckle down here that actually moves the other direction so they can get it exactly perfect with the pin that's on the MLP. And there's a guy up there with a regular framing square lining it up. Wow. You know. This this whole structure here, the MLP or the mobile um, launch platform, it's like it's almost like a submarine inside. The way it's built, there's there's all kinds of rooms and yeah, all the doors are they aren't just regular doors. You have to step over it. It's like a ship. Um, they're all hatches and they're doors, not watertight doors, but they're doors that can be secured because the, the MLP is pressurized um, at launch to make sure nothing gets in or try to prevent things from getting in. So all the doors have, and they have little air vents and there's sometimes there's an airlock. We get to open one door first to get to the next door and, and leave pressure and, you know, it's a, it can be a big deal depending on what time it is you're going into it. And that's an even different perspective looking up. Gives you an idea of all the steel work and the structure and everything that's that's out there. You know that's that's needed to you know get to every area that we need to get to out there. Mm. This is a picture. I, I, my shop also does the ground cooling support um, for the shuttle while it's at the pad. Um, there's several levers, levels of uh, Freon chillers in this little room on the pad surface that circulates Freon through the vehicle and, you know, to keep the vehicle cool. Not not necessarily for people, but it's it does what the the radiators on the payload bay doors do in space mm -hmm. on the ground. So all there's Freon lines flowing all through that thing, all through up by the instrument panels and everything to pull heat out of the components when uh, when the shell's powered up it makes a lot of heat I can only imagine it, it that, it, a lot that it heat. pushes out a lot of heat so especially at launch when everything's running just like it would be like right now it's, it's, it's pretty close to that way it's the closer we get the more things are turned on and they're not turned off it's like right now the vehicle has been powered up for the last two days and it won't power down again until it lands so you got to have that the whole time and it's, it's a big deal when it first gets out there to get this hooked up because after you know the six or seven hours it's rolling out everything even though it's off it's still getting warm in there they want to get it hooked up and they want to get the inside cool and the equipment cool just to make sure it, it you know stays in working condition This is the landing area for those slide wire baskets that we looked at before. You can see the nets that they... Well, you can already see those aren't the nets. The nets are down here. It's hard to see those. Oh, these... Those are the first nets it hits. And there's little, like, I don't know, about foot-long pieces of pipe that the uh, basket's made out of that stick out that will grab a hold of that net. And that net is tied to 
what these are on the bottom here is, is chains. The net's tied to the chain, and, and what slows the basket down is the chain. It's a pretty big chain being drugged through the sand. And that's what slows the baskets down when they get there. And the back net is just in case that doesn't work and they're still going. It, it will stop at the back net, but it's not a nice stop. There's a nice view of the liquid hydrogen ball. Yeah. Not m many smokers on the crew, I imagine. Not no. in that area. <laughs> and you can't actually smoke anywhere inside the pad anymore. You have to go outside the gate if anybody does smoke. So inside the whole thing, you, there's no smoking at all It's a good thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's Look how but it's just perspective, but it it's funny seeing the um here seeing the the booster and everything from this distance next to the tank, um the hydrogen tank because now it looks really small over there. But yeah. if you think about the scene that they took from the launch platform, looking over, it's a long way away. Right, right, We're it is. So it's just perspective. It is. This is driving around the, um, the outside of the, just inside of the fence. Hey, can you back up back to the tank for just a minute? Sure. The big hydrogen tank. What is that? What is that? Um, gosh, you can't see where I'm pointing. Uh, <laughs> okay, the rail along here, the, the silver rail, and underneath there, it almost looks like a, it's a coil it Looks shape. like a radiator coil almost. Oh, right, that's what I was trying to think of, radiator. What is that? That is the way they move hydrogen around. They don't use a pump. Um, there's nothing left go out there. It's all pressure. So what they do is they take some of the liquid hydrogen out of the ball, <coughs> and they run it through all those pipes, and it turns back into a gas. And they use that gas to pressurize the tank to push the liquid up to the vehicle. <coughs> so okay. it's basically an evaporator coil almost. Kind of like that, yeah. yeah. They, they don't use the oxygen side. They actually use pumps over there. Um, but the hydrogen side, they don't have any pump. It's all pressure. Okay. Just a you know, far back perspective there. Yeah. It's funny, of all this, the complexity of it and everything, the things that fascinate me most are the trench and those water bags. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. so funny. It's the simple things. Yeah. So many little things that no one knows about. Little things that that, that aren't glamorous, that aren't you know a big deal, that don't aren't a huge part of you know the whole launch process that, that go on out there that, that you just don't know about. Well, I think that was what uh, is fun about this particular presentation is that we kind of got insight into some of those. Uh, those aspects of it things that uh you know there is a lot of uh there's a lot of big things there but there's also a lot of nuance on a launch pad which you don't really think of yeah. and it's all yeah. an integral part of it. it it's it's amazing how many little bits and pieces there are that it takes to um to, to pull off a launch it is and there there's could probably be 10 more slides like this of different stuff completely different things that you know you could talk about this yeah you know, there's so much so many different things that goes on what are these here those are the uh, the gas batteries we call them they're the the nitrogen stored there the helium and the oxygen gas oxygen stored underneath there and these great big uh cylinders kind of like your uh, like the tube banks kind of like that but just great big Hmm. And then this is our last shot as we are leaving. That's a beauty shot too. Mm -hmm. I like it. It's covered up. Well, and if everything is going right when everybody is listening to this program, uh, then this thing should be, uh, this exact one that we're looking at here should be um, coming up for a launch or We'll remain optimistic and just leave it at that. <laughs> yes, we're we're our fingers. We want it to go right. 
Yeah. And, uh, we really like when it comes out. We're really ready for when to come out, but it takes about a month and it's there. And at the end of that month, we're ready for it to go. We want to, you know, we want to launch. Ready to send it on its yeah. way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I have to imagine that while, you know, I was thinking about, when I was thinking about you guys particularly, I was thinking about, like, conversation at the dinner table and things like that. And, I mean, you, you know, you probably don't talk shop that much. but you probably, Oh, you'd be surprised. Yeah, you're geeks, so you probably do. <laughs> yeah. We talk and, shop a lot. Uh, you know, I just thought about, and I'm sitting there, and, and it's like, we're, we're, we're part of the team that launches the space shuttle. And I'm sure that's probably the way you were when you first started. Uh, but I get back to that idea that even though it has become familiar to you, you still both, you can hear it in your voice, have a lot of awe and respect for, for what you're part of. Sure. Definitely. And and I'll have to say that it it makes it much easier um, to have somebody there to talk to about work and about what you're doing that knows the players and knows the way things are out there because it's it's almost like when you first get out there it's almost like being an exchange student in uh -huh, a foreign uh -huh. country and you don't speak the language at all right, and so right. it's it's very different than anywhere else so it's it's helpful to have um, a spouse that knows what you're talking about now, do you assign acronyms for everything in your house? No. Okay. No. <laughs> Are there any parts of the space shuttle or any part of NASA that doesn't have an acronym assigned to it? Precious few. I, I, they name things on purpose just yeah. to make the acronym. There right. are acronyms within acronyms. We right. have some that they're like stack three deep, I think. Yeah, I, I think that's the... Um, <laughs> I think you you guys can learn more about that at the OOA, the Office of Acronyms. <laughs> it's a little bit out of control. Well, it is, but you think about it. It's a complex structure, and if you had to fully pronounce, it's like medicine in some extent. If you had to fully pronounce the entire name, it would take you five minutes to get one sentence out. Yeah, probably. Yeah. What's funny is that a lot of people out there don't even remember what most of the acronyms um, stand for anymore. And so it's like the letters become the thing. It's like they, they know what it is, but they couldn't tell you what that stands for. <laughs> well, I have to tell you, you've kind of ruined one of them for me, and that's MECO, which is Main Engine Cutoff, which is obviously <laughs> a very critical part. Now, every shuttle launch that I watch, when it's time for MECO, I, I envision our... our, our uh, space Tweep Society mascot, Miko, uh, the little <laughs> Twitter bird in his spacesuit. Is it a he or a she? Um, I think he's, it's a he. Okay. Really? Yeah. No. I think so. <laughs> well, listen, thank you both <laughs> for being with us tonight. And nope. we really enjoyed it. And I'm sure that the viewers of this, this will... Uh, uh, be available uh, for viewing uh, on a, the um, uh, AFM uh, Astronomy FM and the, uh, the Sky Full of Stars website, and it, it's going to be something that uh, I think a lot of people are going to really enjoy. I sure yeah. do. Yeah, we hope so. Special treat, special treat, and of course we'll all be chatting with each other over the next few days um, um, as um, the shuttle um, launches and uh, and the days following following that mission so well thank you very much we're going to end the interview and return to normal programming okay thanks for having us